Good evening all, and welcome. As it's spooky season, I think the time has come for us to dive back into the world of demons. I'm sure they have lots to share with us. So get comfortable, keep your salt at their ready, and let the darkness take control. I'm from India. This happened in one of the southern states there, back in 2012. We were all staying at my grandma's place for summer vacation, as we're plantation owners. We have areca nuts, mostly, some coconut, coffee, and cocoa too. The thing about plantations that you'll find is that they are extremely secluded, apart from neighbouring plantations, which are still a fair distance away. The nearest city is a 45 minute drive on any vehicle via a dirt road. There are no street lights whatsoever, so you better know your way. My grandma lives out there with my eldest maternal uncle and his family, and they usually walk around at night with no fear whatsoever, which is something that I would never do. I'm a bit scared of the dark. So during vacations, we all gathered at this plantation for a get together. Now this includes our family, two of my mum's sisters and their families and two of her brothers and their families. Six siblings in total. We get there early, like 9am or so, and my aunt and their families are there a few days before us. Me being the eldest guy, I get pampered a lot because I have some badass elder sisters and yet again, come off as a bit of a scaredy cat in comparison to them even my youngest seven-year-old cousin. She's absolutely fearless. But back to the story. So we all got there by 7pm, except my youngest uncle, who was unmarried at the time. He's the only one who prefers the city to the plantation, and despite being religious, doesn't really participate in many of the activities. He's the only one to refuse to do a special rite of passage within our traditions. Maybe... I'll talk about that another time. In their generation of about 14 guys in total, back in the day, it was a big deal. He lives in a major city which is a good four hour drive from the plantation and to avoid traffic, decided to drive in the evening and get here by 11 or so, which was a very bad idea. So we started driving at 8 p.m. from the house. We had an outdoor barbecue going around that time but when 10 rolled around, we were all getting quite tired, so I decided to call it a night and figured he would just arrive whenever he did. We never locked the doors here because we have six huge dogs who we are more than confident guard the place perfectly adequately. Now, it's getting late and they are small slopes and drops that lead to the front of our house. And it can be tough even for locals on the dirt road. So as you can imagine, taking these roads at night can be a little bit tricky. We all fall asleep, and then 1am rolls around and our dogs start barking, which is rare, because they're never together once we take them off their leashes for the night. So naturally we awoke, figuring that my uncle was home. We love him, because he's really cool, and so we peep out the window, and we're all sharing a huge room by the way, and we see that his car is stuck on the slope, and two of the dogs are circling the car with their tails tucked between their legs. That was all we thought. That is when we heard the howling, loud and sharp. I remember my nuts crawling to my throat. It was one of the dogs who was at the door, howling, facing the door. At first, we thought our uncle had probably accidentally run over one of the dogs, which would have been terrible enough, but no, all of this happened in a matter of seconds, but it was so much to take in that it felt longer. Then our grandma and my eldest uncle opened the front door, and the dog howling at the door bolted at the car. At this point, five dogs were circling the car, sniffing and growling at God knows what. There was still a good 20 to 30 feet distance between the car and the house, so my grandma called out to Mama, asking him to park, and that the dogs wouldn't do anything, figuring he's scared of them. My uncle didn't respond. The car was dead. The only light was coming from the house, so my eldest uncle started walking towards the car. 
and thought perhaps he was having car trouble or something. So before he could reach halfway, my uncle opened the car door, but not the driver end, the rear one, like he wasn't driving at all, and started walking towards the house. We all thought it was weird for a second. Maybe he was just trying to be cool and pull a prank, but then he walked past the eldest uncle like he didn't even see him, same with grandma. At this point, we're all getting worried. So we cousins walk down and get a glimpse of our uncle before he dashes for the temple room inside the house. He looks so pale. His eyes were bloodshot and we got scared thinking he was drunk and that he drove here in that state. Then it hit the fan. One of the dogs ran inside the house. The remaining were all outside, looking very, very nervous and whining and not wanting to get in. My grandma and eldest uncle came in shortly after. By this point, everyone in the house was awake and we kids were told to get back upstairs. But obviously we were way too close to pissing ourselves to even move. And then we heard this laughing. My youngest uncle was laughing in this deep voice that almost seemed demonic. I remember gripping my sister's arm and whimpering worse than the dogs when I heard it. For a second, every fearful memory seemed to crawl all over me, and all I wanted to do was to get up in a ball and cry. It seemed that was the general consensus among everyone who heard the laugh. My grandma approached my uncle, and he shot her this nasty look, and then started speaking in ancient Tulu, a South Indian language dialect. I couldn't understand a word of it, but my grandma did, and she just sobbed and yelled back at him. At this point, most of my cousins and aunts were in tears. And then my uncle started walking back to the door, saying something again in the strange dialect. At that point, my eldest uncle and my aunt's husband tackled and restrained him. He was then at the foot of the stairs between us and the adults. Keep in mind, these are big guys and strong. And one of them was a commander in the army, and the other one a pro kabaddi player. And my eldest uncle can hold his own. He's 6'2 and well built. And between the three of them, it took all their combined strength to hold down a skinny 5'10 guy. My middle uncle, who seemed to be missing during the whole commotion, rushed in with a dude from a nearing plantation, a relative of ours. He's like my grandfather's cousin or something, but he's our uncle's age. He's a priest in our community. So he came in and they all went to the temple room, grabbed the ceremonial kalash and a sword and the tirith, which is like holy water. And I kid you not, he started talking to mama in the same dialect. He then touched the hilt of the sword to his forehead and started chanting. My uncle thrashed and throbbed like he was, well, possessed. And then he emptied the holy water on his head. My uncle went limp and fell to the floor. He started seizing up and my uncles turned him on his side. He was dazed as hell, started crying, and then threw up all over the floor. My grandma was stunned and crying in a chair. Everyone was in tears, the dogs refused to leave, and the rest were at the doorstep. My aunt tried to shoo them away, but they didn't budge. The priest insisted, we let them stay. They saved his uncle's life. Then we heard this thump outside. We were too scared to move. But the commander uncle went outside. The car that was stuck on the slope had rolled down and bumped against the house. The priest went out and did the same swordy thing to the car. Instead of the hilt, he used the blade and asked no one to approach it until sunrise. It was around 1am at that point. Everyone was too messed up to go back to sleep and the house smelt like puke, wet dog, and scarily of smoke. My uncle had passed out. We kids were all huddled up in the hall and the adults were all talking. One of my uncles was keeping watch on the uncle who was in the other room. I can't remember when I fell asleep. I don't remember dreaming or anything. And honestly, when I woke up, I was thinking that this was all just a dream. In the morning at seven or so, my uncles decided to move the car to the garage. And that's when we saw it a faint red handprint on the windshield. The spooky part, it was on the inside of the driver's side. Oh, and that dialect? I pestered my eldest cousin for days 
and she finally translated it for me. The thing he kept repeating over and over was, I'm going to take your son to where you won't find what's left of him. I am from Eastern Europe. I'm going to share with you a story that my grandparents and mother used to talk about. My great grandfather went to the forest to pick some wood. He went there during the night, since it was illegal to take wood from the forest. By chance, he met another man from the village who was doing the same thing. They agreed to stick together. A little time passed when they saw a small billy goat. Its fur was black. My great grandfather assumed that someone had lost it. So they decided to take the billy goat with them in order to share its meal later. They put the billy goat in a sack and then weird stuff began to happen. The sack became heavier and heavier and they often exchanged it between them. At some point, the billy goat was so agitated that my great grandfather said, take it easy, billy goat. The paranormal thing is that the billy goat repeated the exact same words in a weird voice. My great-grandfather had a gun and shot the sack twice. There was nothing but thin air. They were convinced it was the devil, since they had in mind to steal wood. This is a small piece of the entire story, and I swear it's true. I woke up one night and checked my phone to see if my son had texted me goodnight. He has done this every day for years. I looked over and noted that it was 2.20 a.m. I put my phone away and stared up at the ceiling, lying on my back, waiting for sleep. My wife was besides me spooning my side, with her back to the only window in the room, which was about 20 feet from her to my right. About 10 feet to my left, was a walk-in closet and bathroom. Both doors were closed. Behind my head was the headboard and outside wall. My feet extended out towards our other bathroom wall. Our bedroom door was closed as usual, and our only window, which opens to the parking lot three floors below, was mostly blocked with a blackout shade and decorative curtains. A small amount of light from a street light just outside crept into the room and gave the black shade an almost vague orange glow. As I stared up at the ceiling attempting to fall asleep, I noticed that the air in the room felt thick, like static on a TV, and I could see tiny bits of light flickering all over my peripheral. There seemed to be a noise in the background like TV static, and I assumed it was my imagination but I began to feel very, very scared. I attempted to close my eyes, but the scary feeling turned into a danger feeling. I turned to my right to wake up my wife, as she usually comforts me when I have issues of this kind, when I noticed a large figure standing in front of the window, partially behind the curtain, and my fight or flight instantly kicked in. I felt imminent danger. But at the same time, it didn't feel possible. So I closed my eyes tightly and reopened them. The figure immediately took a sidestep to its left. And now I could see the whole thing in its entirety. It was big and dark, possibly shiny. It was very tall, had long arms, and I swear it had horns. It was totally silent. The static shh sound was all that I could hear. I knew it wasn't possible, but I was in total panic. My body was telling me to run. I blinked. It had moved closer. I began shaking my wife and screaming her name over and over. And each time I looked up at the thing, it was closer than before. I couldn't understand why she wouldn't wake up. I shook her harder and harder yelling at her as loud as I could, practically screaming her name and fighting the urge to run, but knowing that if she didn't wake up immediately, something horrible and violent was going to happen. 
The last time I looked up, it was towering over us only a few steps away, and I couldn't catch my breath. And then, she was holding me, and her bedside lamp was on, and everything was totally quiet. She told me I had been screaming in my sleep, screaming loudly like she'd never heard before. She says that she couldn't wake me, that I just screamed and tried to fight her off. I was almost crying. That was one of the worst events I'd ever had, and it absolutely terrified me. I know most of you were going to say it was a dream or sleep paralysis or perhaps a night terror, but to me it was real. It occurred at a time in my life where strange and unexplained things were happening to me frequently. Long story short, over a six yearish period in my life, something was trying to make me end my own life. Something was slowly affecting every aspect of my life, playing the long game. During this time, I had regular paranormal experiences. I lost my high-paying career, lost my house, both my cars, nearly all my possessions, and became estranged from my son, my parents, and all my loved ones. Eventually, I got a divorce, was charged with crimes I didn't commit, and was faced with more hardship and depression than I thought that I could possibly survive. This is not a story of how I found Jesus, although I have always been a Christian, but I do believe this could have been demonic. I have read true accounts of others who have been led to near taking their life over a long period of time by something malevolent. I'm glad to say that many years later, everything ended up working out. I'm 14. My friend Jay is a year younger, and we're both on a mission to find the faith that's right for us. I stayed away from Christianity because I was pretty much forced into going to church when I was younger, did not enjoy it, and my older sister's ex-boyfriend Dylan introduced us to Satanism. In hindsight, should have walked away. He swears it's all about loving yourself, being your own god, and putting your faith in no one but yourself. Okay, I'll bite. Things are good for a few weeks, and then things get weird. He wants to start dragging us to sacrifices and summoning into the mix. So Jay and myself agree that summoning something sounds interesting, but we're adamant about not killing anything. We do the summons, didn't seem like it worked, and later that week, two Damas teenagers started hearing weird sounds and seeing weird stuff in our homes. Obviously that's us we decided to tag out of this mess and repent. One of Jay's friends goes to a local Baptist church that was having a lock-in, where a large number of kids are locked in a church with some pastors overnight playing basketball and religious-themed games. We decide to go. We arrive early, and that's when it gets weird. The two of us are walking through the church on our way, talking with a pastor. We feel the urge to tell him about our misadventures with the ex-boyfriend of my sister. Along the way, I keep hitting cold spots, hearing footsteps and scratching in the rafters. The area we were in only had one floor, and we heard whispers too, which Jay heard also. We're getting creeped out, decide not to hunt for the pasta, and just join in on all the other teenage games. Later in the evening, we're playing hide and seek in the church, where one group are the Romans trying to catch the Christians attempting to evade them and to get to the safe room. That's the underground church. We're on the Christians team and everyone is split into smaller groups to make evading easier. Making our way through this dark as hell church, I suddenly have to use the restroom like I've been holding it in for days. Jay was watch for the Romans from just inside the restroom door while I take care of my situation. I finish, flush, wash my hands, and glance up at the mirror in front of me, and my eyes lock on the reflection. It starts getting darker around the mirror me. I start freaking out. My facial features begin distorting a little bit, and it looks almost demonic. I blink, regain my composure, and nope the hell out the restroom, and sprint right past Jay, past a group of Romans, and straight to the pastor's office. Jay is trailing behind me trying to figure out what happened, found the pastor and demanded to be let out of the building. I didn't say a word about it for a week, and never wanted to go back. Recently, I told a minister friend about this, and he told me that it was a demonic force trying to coax me back. 
Well, he sure did a crap job, I thought. He then asked me, did you go to God? The answer was no. Well then, the minister friend said, he still won. You didn't go back to God, which is exactly what he wanted. Maybe so, but I found Wicca and have been fine with that ever since. No demons in sight for now. I met a friend roughly over a year ago. He and I became pretty close in terms of friendship. He helped me when I was down and I helped him. Over the course of a few months, he started getting a tad hostile. One day we were hanging out when I think I saw one of his eyes change a bit. Now I'm huge into UFOs and all that, and we were drinking so I asked him if he was reptilian. He obviously said no, but I kept pushing him as a joke to admit it. We were then were talking about his supposed constellation and he said something like, I don't really want to tell you this. And I pressed him on to tell me, you have two years to live. I obviously was quite confused. And then he says, well, not now, starting from next year. I was pretty distraught after that. Then we slowly started growing apart and even started to diss each other subtly. We stopped talking to each other and then he vanished from my life. Come to now. I have a cousin who I consider a brother. He is gay, as is the friend I just mentioned. And we grew up together and even had a music group and performed together. One of the new houses he moved into a few years ago was odd and had familiar sigils and the like, along with some odd markings around the house. I noticed from some research I did that they were wards to try and get rid of demons. Over the course of him living there, he tells me dark spirits revisit him often, even when teasing him, literally nearly every night. He would even have conversations with them. I tried to help him with the sigils and things to ward them off, but he mostly didn't want to. We would still always hang out, of course, every now and then. And then he disappeared about a few months ago, and then we decided to hang out again. This was yesterday. He came over, we did our usual shenanigans, and I'm also into quantum theory and started discussing quantum immortality while writing it on a board, when he laughs during one moment, and I can see his ears getting all funny while I'm talking, and he says, you know you only have about a year left. That's when I lost it. What did you say? I said you only have a year left to live, my cousin replied. Well, I was thought I had a little more than that, I said. He continued laughing, and I kicked him out the house while going off at the same time. All he said was, you still have some time left. Stop being like that to me. Keep in mind, these two people don't know each other or hang out together or talk. How could they both be saying that? Could it be that they know demons or are possessed? I need some answers, please. I'm not a religious person or a believer in the paranormal. I know I don't have a mental illness and have never abused drugs, but I'm trying to have an open mind and thought I'd ask those who are more knowledgeable than I in these matters. Normally I forget most of my dreams or remember only fragments of them. However, I had a lucid dream a year or so ago that was truly terrifying and kind of haunts me. I wish I had forgotten it. I don't want to create a gigantic testament of what it was, so I'll keep to the bare bones of it. I'm on a bus with other people. Outside the bus is the universe, so the bus is traveling through space. There is a severe feeling of loss of time. It is a lucid dream, so being self-aware was painful because I felt dulled to time inside it. I finally managed to get out. As I'm entering a sort of citadel made of nonsensical geometric shapes from the outside. On the inside, there's a sort of labyrinth. Not being able to traverse the labyrinth, I wall myself to the center of the citadel. There are lots of mirrors in the central room. None of them reflect my body. In the absolute center is a pale, sickly looking woman with long black hair holding a child, with some serpent and fish-like features. The woman and the child is reflected by the mirrors, and as I'm walking towards them, they seem completely oblivious to me. 
But as I get too close, the woman is utterly apathetic to my approach. The child in her arms does see me. Its face turns into a demonic one with cruel eyes and a mouth with many, many teeth, like a shark. So it screams an ear shattering sound, like a hellish screech that quakes the entire citadel. The pale woman cradling the child is still unaffected, as if blind and deaf. The screech is so loud, so terrifying, and the only way I can describe it is soul piercing and mind shattering. So at this point, the sheer terror wakes me up. As I'm waking up in real life, I feel unable to move for a bit, as if suffering sleep paralysis. I can't tell if I spent 30 seconds or 3 minutes, but only then did I finally manage to climb out of bed and get up on my feet. I also had some hallucinations of text and colours on the walls. I hear it's normal with sleep paralysis, if that is what I had. But the reason I shared this is because I was looking for answers for a while. This lucid nightmare still haunts me. It's the only nightmare I've ever had in my life that stayed fresh in my mind for so long. The memory of it, the imagery, and the emotional trauma is still as fresh as if it happened yesterday. It's hard to get any real input due to most people not taking dreams seriously. So I wanted to see what you guys thought, if perhaps it could have been something paranormal or demonic. My entire life, I was followed around multiple states from my childhood to adulthood. I'm not sure who or what it was, but it always found me. It seemed to be trying hard to make me extremely uncomfortable. I was a Christian as a kid, and whenever I used religious calls, prayers and phrases, it would go away for a while. I spent most of my life pretending not to notice anything things moving or wait on my bed next to me, strange sounds when it was quiet. I eventually lost my belief in Judeo-Christianism and was given advice by a pagan friend on how to get rid of it. Most of the advice was a huge lifestyle and personality change. Stay positive, know your power over them, and eliminate unnecessary worry and fear. It worked. It took practice, but it worked completely. She explained to me that religion is usually used in these situations because it is total belief. Belief strengthens intent. But if you have strong intent without belief, it is exactly the same. Either way, my problem was solved for a while. I ended up getting married and having kids. That made things start happening again in whichever home we lived. I noticed that it was much more difficult to fight negative with positive when there are five other people in your home to add to the negative. I can't make them change the way I had to as a young adult. Since then, I've seen signs of activity and immediately turned up my protection and notch. The activity goes away but comes back if I left my guard down. It's been back and forth, and I've always handled it pretty well. But about a week ago, I had my first nightmare in years. My youngest daughter and wife also had nightmares that night. I immediately noticed the signs and took my usual steps to make it go away again. It hasn't been working. And the next night I was in the kitchen late at night and my dog started growling, baring teeth and had his hair standing on end. He's literally never done this. I've had him for seven months and never heard him growl unless he's playing with the toy with our other dog. The same night when I was putting my daughter to sleep, she looked over to the window, glared and then grabbed onto me and squeezed. She kept trying to sneak peeks back over there. The blinds were drawn and the windows were closed. This was the third time that day that I saw her staring at nothing, confused and scared. She's been falling over a lot more lately, sometimes bruising herself. Last night, I told my wife about these signs and asked her to try and stay positive. Stop stressing so much, you know, the basics. This is not the first time we've had these conversations and she agreed and understood. We went asleep and I slept horribly. My wife told me about half hour ago that at 2 a.m. ish, my daughter was sleeping on our bed at the foot, which she doesn't usually do because she loves to snuggle. And she started screaming horribly. 
She wasn't moving any part of her body like it was being held still for her. Her eyes were wide open and she was just screaming bloody murder. I'm at work, but my first instinct is to haul ass home and confront it like I have done in the past. But I'm not in the right state to do so and I'm just too angry and that'll only feed it. My real problem is, I think I've passed a piece of it to my daughter, like a GD virus. The techniques I've been using for seven years aren't working anymore, and I don't know what to do. I have two teenagers and a very stressed out wife. The negativity in my house is off the charts, and if anyone has any advice, I'd certainly appreciate it. I live with my dad, sister and cousin. My cousin is male and 16 years old, and for some reason decided to summon some demons for wealth, good mental health and one thing or another. This was about a year and a half ago, and I was completely unaware of this until he started talking about some weird dreams he'd been having. He then described all the exact details of the dream, beside being in different locations of the house that I had a few nights before, and that's when I got really worried. Here's the dream. So I start in the dream in my room, which is at the top level of my three-story house. And I have an impending doom feeling, so I look down to my stairs, and there it is. A dark shadow standing halfway down them, so I run at it, trying to run past it to get downstairs. And for some reason, I stop right in front of it, feeling the worst burning inside, an impending doom feeling I've ever experienced. And it just morphs into a dark shadow cat. Then I kind of snap out of it and start running to the basement of the house, all while it's following me. I get to my dad's room and start beating on the door and screaming, trying to get him to open it. And everything just slowly starts to lose sound as the cat comes closer and I'm screaming, but no sound comes out. Then I woke myself up from a whimpering type scream and my cousin said he had the exact same dream but it started at his room, which is the basement as well. The shadow person morphs. He beats on my dad's door and the cat rubs against his leg and he wakes up. If that wasn't strange enough on its own, he has started to hear voices calling his name getting closer and louder each time, telling him to wake up, even when he's at school and away from home. And today he went to walk to the buses and there was a humanist shadow figure standing near a barn accompanied by the sound of thumping that got louder and louder. He said he tries to call out to it, but it wouldn't respond, and it set off the motion detector lights at the barn, and it just still remained a dark, shadowy figure. The thumping continued to get louder, until it just stopped, and the figure just disappeared. That has been pretty much how it's been for a while. I have other odd experiences as well. But my question is, does anyone know what it is? And if there's any way that I can protect myself from it or make it go away. When I was a preteen, we had three TVs. One on the TV stand that stopped working and two on the floor. One which worked and the other one was for the camera we had pointed at the outside door to see who was outside it. You can probably guess why my parents did that, but it's not really relevant to explain why the third TV. One night I was home by myself reading. The lights were on and since this is a single mobile home, basically the kitchen and living room were one room and just had one tile and the other had carpet. So when I looked into the reflection of the TV on the stand, I could see the kitchen and living room. Now looking into the reflection, I saw a shadow just floating by the ceiling in the kitchen. My dad did have an old WB frog hanging from the ceiling, but when I tapped it and looked into the reflection, I saw the frog moving, but the shadow was staying still. It was just hovering there. All I know is that it was dark. I couldn't see through it and it was bald, like there was no hair. This pitch black figure. I sat on the couch, staring at the reflection since I couldn't find what was causing it and thought I was going crazy. When my parents got home, I had my stepmom look at what I saw. And while we were both looking at it, me seeing what I saw the whole time, she was a beautiful angel with flowing hair smiling at her. We saw two completely different images. My dad didn't see it at all, 
Since they had brought home food, I had looked away and couldn't see it again after that, although somehow that TV started working again. I do have to say my home did feel very oppressive at all times. My father was always angry, and while he was never physical with me, he scared me. My stepmom was always emotional and there were times when there was fighting, and she would threaten to end her own life. I spent as much time as I could away from home, until I wound up moving in with my grandmother. Did we see a demon provoking our family? Back in 2015, I had this experience that made me realize the world is a stranger place than I thought it was. It was around 8 p.m. and I was coming back home from the movies. I dashed my foot against a stone and my body started to run against my will. A supernatural force had hijacked my legs that made me sprint extraordinarily. I finally managed to halt and walk normally after being played with for about two kilometers, which is a long way. As I tried to gather some sense of what happened, I saw something unusual in front of me. Near the signpost of an SDA church that I was a member of, there was a glowing shadow, a diabolical silhouette that just appeared and what made it creepy was that its half was waist downwards, and it had no upper body. I was struck with fright. I knew my mind could not just make up such things, it was real. I started chanting Jesus' name several times, and I approached a stranger by the shops, and rhapsodized to him what I'd seen, and requested him to accompany me to our gate. I didn't even see his face because it was so dark. He was not even shocked by my narration. I did not disclose anything to my parents as we had supper, but dad noticed my unusual stillness. We prayed and departed to sleep. And that is where my nightmares began. I could not catch a wink of sleep. I tried to kill time by reciting an SDA fundamental belief about Jesus and Christians having power over the forces of darkness. This really calmed me down. Then late into the night I felt an ominous presence. The dog outside started barking and flapping its ears, and whenever that happened I got physically attacked, by a force so strong that it was pressing down on me, as if it wanted to gain entry into my body. I later thought it was the upper part of the demon that also wanted to inhabit me. I sweated, cried, and prayed under my blankets as I longed for sunrise. It was the longest night ever. The next day I realized that my legs were unusually stiff, and that they could literally just walk up a hill or hop to a spot without me putting effort in. I had been possessed by a half-genie. My cousin had also commented on my unusual speed when I ran. We were together watering cattle at a river, when I decided to exorcise the pesky demon. I immersed myself in the water and read out a scripture from my pocket testament. When I reached home, I washed my hands, which were also possessed wrist downwards, and I knew this because I had to hold a pen, and the handwriting was terrible. Whenever I tried to write, Holy Spirit, it's almost as if my hand would deny me. I also wetted my lower half, poured the contaminated water and got ready for the genie to be expelled. Not sure if I was stimulating a voice of an angel in my head or if it was real, but I started the process and began convulsing. My thigh muscles contracted severely, so did my hands, and something told me to count to 700, and my frozen hands could be set free. I don't know what could have happened if anybody had busted in during this weird stuff. But when I finished, that was that, and I was very glad to be relieved of whatever the hell that was. Wednesday. My friend told me he's a Satanist. I thought it wasn't a big deal, so I kept going around my day to day. Then the day after, I decided, hey, why don't I ask him to summon a demon or something? After he did it, a few minutes later, the name of the person that was the target was written in the corner of my notebook. I know he didn't write it, because I was talking to him the whole time, 
It just ended up there. We laughed it off, and later in the evening, everything was normal. I got home from school and continued with everything. I had trouble falling asleep, but I just blamed it on taking a nap after school. I ended up falling asleep at 2am, sometimes in between 2am and 6am and something called my name. I know it wasn't my mum because she was asleep when I got up from school, so I don't know who it was. There was another thing that was odd about that moment. When I heard my name, I sat up in my bed and said, yes, I don't know why. I was in a deep sleep and never sit up when someone calls my name. The day after things were normal, other than what happened in the morning. I talked to my friends about it and most of them said not to worry. When I mentioned it to my Satanist friend, he said, don't blame me. I went on with the day, but in band one, one of my sheet musics went from my music stand to the last chair, who went up to give it to the band director. I don't know how she got it. All I know is that strange things are now starting to happen to me. Hey guys, it's Mort Hinton. Thank you so much for listening. I'm sorry for being away the past few days. I'm going to be honest, I did want to work. I did want to record some stuff. But um, I've been going through some stuff lately. Now, um, some of you might be aware I've got this problem ongoing, this medical issue. Where I constantly need to feel like I need to use the bathroom. And as you can imagine, it gets pretty irritating. The doctors I go to don't really seem to have a clue what's going on. And it's very uncomfortable to feel that way all day, all the time, even now. So yeah, it gets worse in the evenings though, but, but it's still pretty annoying. So on top of that, I have what I think is called a globular or globular sensation, which is where you feel like there's something stuck in the back of your throat. I wrote a line that it said it to go away on its own, but it hasn't, obviously. And that's made narrating quite challenging. And seeing as my job is with my voice, it's a bit rubbish as it makes it hard to, to narrate properly. And I really like narrating, but it can be quite exhausting when it starts to annoy your throat. Combined with always needing to go to the bathroom, of course, which is just great. So I'm going to be going to the medic about that probably tomorrow, hopefully. Uh, and yeah, I need to find out what's going on. Part of me thinks that it could be stress, but I have tried to, you know, do things to unstress me and take a few days off, but nothing really seems to be working so far. And I know maybe I sound like a broken record just saying, oh, I'm complaining about this, but the truth is it is what it is. And I don't want to sound complainy or whiny, but it, it, you know, it is quite annoying and a little bit scary at times. So, you know, that's that's just how things are. Um, I just thought I'd be as honest as I could with you guys so you could understand where I'm coming from. So if one day I don't put something out, hopefully you understand that, you know, a condition might have flared up or my voice just really isn't cooperating with me that day because of whatever the hell was happening in the back of my throat. But hopefully I get some magic pills for my throat and then, you know, that'll be fine the constantly needing to go to the bathroom. That's a bit more annoying. And I've been issued a whole variety of pills now, some of which worked at first, but now they stopped working. I wonder if it was more of a placebo effect. The annoying thing is, I don't think the placebo effect works twice if it's the case, because I carried on taking the pills and then eventually they just stopped working. Who knows? Anyway, that was my second opinion. Maybe I need a third one now. I hope all of you guys are good and healthy and well. Um, I'm going to sign off for now. I've got something cool planned for Halloween. Uh, I'm just going to tell you now. It's 100 ghost stories. I've done it for two years in a row now. And it's not a compilation. It's 100 new and original ghost stories. So I hope that you guys like it. I'm going to try and prepare it a few days before. Because one Halloween I... It li I literally took all day. I recorded a hundred stories in about f six hours, and then I managed to trim it down to four and a half, and it was hard. So I don't think I'm gonna do that this year. I'm gonna try and play it safe. But for now, it's time for me to sign off. Stay awesome.
and I'll see you in the next one.